Welcome to the podcast of Living Faith Fellowship in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Now, Pastor Rich preaches the message, The Furtherance of the Gospel, from Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. We pray that God will use this sermon to speak to you directly. And now, to Pastor Rich. So a guy named Forrest McCann wrote of the origins of that old hymn that we just sang, It Is Well With My Soul, which was originally written by Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford went through many trials and losses during a specific time of his life that led him to write that hymn. First, the great Chicago fire of 1871 financially ruined him. He was a lawyer who had a lot of money and invested in a lot of properties. And then the great Chicago fire happened and he lost a lot. Not to be outdone by that, he lost even more money during the economic downturn of 1873. And so after losing all this money, he made a plan to go to England and help Dwight Moody in some evangelism he was doing over there. But Horatio got held back because of some business he had to take care of. So he sent his wife and his four daughters ahead of him, and he was going to follow later. While crossing the ocean, this ship that his four daughters and wife were on collided with another sea vessel, and it sunk. His wife sent him a telegram. His wife Anna said two words in this telegram, saved alone. Later, he was traveling to meet his wife, And as the ship passed by the very place where his four daughters died, he penned that song, It Is Well With My Soul. Through a tragedy of one man, he wrote a hymn that has touched so many people's lives because of that tragedy. Keep that in the back of your mind as you open your Bibles with me this morning to Philippians chapter 1 as we go back into that epistle from the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. As you're turning there, let's catch up real quick. Last time, remember, Paul expressed his thankfulness to these Christians because not only their friendship and fellowship to him, but their fellowship in promoting the gospel. Paul had remembered all that God had done through these Christians and all the work. And he was so thankful. And remember what he said in verse three, my one of my favorite verses of all the book. I thank God upon every remembrance of you. He referenced his feelings of joy, even while awaiting his execution. You see, the Philippians had partnered with Paul to spread the gospel. And how did they do that? They did it through prayer and through friendship and financial support. Then we learned how Jesus always finishes what he starts. Paul was confident that the grace of God would finish the good work that he began in the Philippians. It never ceases to amaze me how the God of the universe, the all-powerful God who needs nothing, by the way, and needs nobody, by the way, chooses to partner with us and allow us the blessing of serving him. We learn that Paul was chained for the gospel. And this is how we ended last week. From grateful hearts, us redeemed ones of the Lord should serve the Lord with our time and our talents and our treasures as we partner with him for the furtherance of the gospel. And so today, Paul continues in his prayer for the Philippians. And he's going to communicate, and this might be news to you as a Christian, the furtherance of the gospel is so much more important than the trials we face in this life. And that may sound harsh, especially if you're going through a trial this morning. It may sound harsh, but can I just tell you that this 110-year life is simply a dress rehearsal for eternity And you might look at it like this, that this life is one grain of sand on the shores of Oregon Beach. This is a dress rehearsal. And so the things that God allows in our lives here are for a purpose. And we'll get into that. But number one there in your notes, knowledge and discernment. If your Bibles are open, Philippians chapter one, look at verse nine with me. The Apostle Paul says, in this I pray that your love may abound still more and more, so your love will grow more and more. How? In knowledge and discernment. In knowledge and discernment. 
There was a band, I don't think they're very well known, maybe you've heard them, called the Beatles. <laughs> they have this song, back before I was born, called All You Need Is Love. Part of the lyrics say this, nothing you can know that isn't known, nothing you can see that isn't shown. There's nowhere you can be that isn't where you're meant to be. It's easy. All you need is love. Na, 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 na. <laughs> In our society today, a lot of people make their own explanation of love, even within our parenting styles. But unfortunately, in our world today, the word love has been watered down to the point that we're actually causing damage with it. There in your notes, the Apostle Paul was not telling the Philippians to have a blind love, but rather a love that was based upon the standards of God. The word that Paul used here in Philippians 1.9 is the word agapeo or agape, you may have heard it said, which means charity, unconditional, perfect love by the way that expects nothing in return. There in your notes, Paul prayed that the Philippians would mature and their maturity would be evident, demonstrated through love, growing more and more through knowledge and discernment. Let's try and figure out what Paul's talking about here with knowledge and discernment. The word knowledge, according to Strong's Concordance, means a precise or correct knowledge. And it's used in the New Testament for knowledge of things, catch this, ethical and divine. Okay? In Christianity.com, it says, in the Bible, knowledge refers to examples, truths, and commands. And, and here's the hard part, that God not only wants us to know and believe but heed, but follow. Not only to know them, not only believe them, but follow them. And so the Lord gives us a gift of knowledge and he expects us to live according to the knowledge he has given us. Now, along with that knowledge, he gives us something else. It's called wisdom, wisdom. You may ask me, you know, I don't have wisdom. I don't know how to get it. Well, great. The Bible has an answer for that. There's an app for that. It's called the Bible. James 1.5 says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. If you lack wisdom, very simple. Ask. And he promises he'll give it. Now, it's been said, and I don't know who originally coined this, but it's been said that knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, where wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. <laughs> Paul said to his protege, Timothy, about godly knowledge, these words. At the end of Paul's life, he said, O oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoiding the profane and evil babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. So how does a Christian, because here's where I want to go for this first point. How does a Christian determine what godly knowledge is? By discernment. Discernment. It's a gift. It's speaking of moral discernment, ethical matters, and catch this. This is what Strong says about discernment. It's to distinguish, to separate, and to examine. Wow, think about that. To distinguish, to separate, and to examine. It's to distinguish things that differ. You know, in kindergarten or maybe in preschool, what two things don't match? Right? Maybe they put four things out there, and which one of these doesn't go with the others? That's called discernment. There in your notes, according to gotquestions.org, a discerning person will acknowledge the worth of God's word. So a discerning Christian, very simply, is able to hear things and know that it goes against what God has said. You ever have that and you're in the middle of a conversation and maybe this person, girls, you're dating a spiritual guy. You know, Satan was spiritual too. 
But you're, you hear something and all of a sudden you go, that didn't sound right. That's called discernment of the Holy Spirit. Go with that. Proverbs 8.8. 8. All the words of my mouth are with righteous. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. They are all plain to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. All right, so here comes the hard one for me. Maybe this is easy for you. The first part is easy. Sincerity without offense. I am sincere. Sometimes I have a hard time being sincere without offense. Look at verse 10. The Apostle Paul, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, that's who gives them to you, to the glory and praise of God. There in your notes, Paul said biblical love is a love that has knowledge and all discernment. Why? So it can approve of those things which are excellent. Excellent, again, means more valuable or different than. Okay, so you've been given knowledge and all discernment to determine what things are different or more valuable than. And notice he says that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. People use love to excuse all kinds of behavior. And maybe I'm afraid to tell you the truth because, after all, I love you, so I don't want to offend you. But if it disagrees with the word of God, I'm not trying to offend you. And I do love you and I'll accept you just as you are. But I'm not going to lie to you. And neither is the word of God. So Paul says, I'm praying for you that you have knowledge and discernment and, and so that you can approve of those things that are excellent and be sincere without offense until Christ. Warren Wiersbe said, Christian love is not blind. The heart and the mind work together so we can have discerning love and love discernment. There in your notes. Paul wanted his friends to grow in discernment and being able to distinguish the things that differ. The ability to distinguish, by the way, is a mark of maturity. It's a mark of maturity. Then notice Paul says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Now, every time I read something like that, I automatically think the fruit, not fruits, the fruit of the spirit that Paul mentions in Galatians 5, right? So the fruits of righteousness, the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Catch this. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Now, the thing is, we know we cannot produce the fruit of righteousness or the fruit of the Spirit on our own. We can't. It's impossible. And he says it again here in these verses. John 15, 5, Jesus himself said, He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And I would say that's nothing of spiritual value. Adam Clark said, Every genuine follower of God has glory in his view. All that he says, all that he does, or all that he intends, he loves to glorify God. He first glorifies him by his conversion and then showing forth the glorious work of God through the power of God. Number three, Paul's arrest furthered the gospel. Look at verse 12. Paul says, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. The things that happened to me, all this bad stuff furthered the gospel. What a crazy thought. Again, I would tell you that this life is a dress rehearsal, a grain of sand on the beaches of Oregon compared to eternity. And what would you say a thousand years from now about the trials you had here? Probably not much. 
But there's an aberrant teaching going around the churches today that says that any person who suffers trials or suffering is either caused by a lack of faith or some secret sin in their life. Now, I'm, I'm here to tell you, the Apostle Paul did not have any secret sin in his life. And I think the Apostle Paul had some faith. So this seems to throw that thinking out. Here's the age old question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why? Well, I'm going to give you three quick reasons before we move on. The first one's probably the most important. Paul said in Romans 7, 18, For I know that in me, that's in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Okay? So there's no good thing in us apart from Christ. Second of all, being obedient to the Lord and his calling in your life does not mean that life's always going to be easy. In fact, I would tell you, being obedient to the Lord and his call in your life is life's never going to be easy. If someone led you to Christ and said, all your dreams come true and it's all rainbows and fairy tales after you come to Christ, come see me afterwards. I want to correct that stinking thinking. We live in a fallen world and sin happens. It's so many times like the cartoon that, you know, you're getting hit with a couple of pebbles and we're like, why, Lord, why? And then all of a sudden it backs out and we see the Lord getting pelted with boulders. And only once in a while, a little pebble hits us. My question is this. If we live in a fallen, rebellious world where sin has come in, why does God allow any good to happen? Forget why does God allow bad. Why does God allow any good? Why? Because of his grace and his mercy. I mean, if he gave us what we deserve, people, where would we be? And, and here's the third one, and this is where we need to live. The Lord uses bad things in our life for his glory and our good. As obedient followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has a plan for our life, even during the hard desert moments of life. Now, if you're going through a trial this morning, please don't hear me say, you know, just suck it up, buttercup. I have been through my dad's suicide when I was a teenager, my mom passing away. We've been broke. We've had the best of times. We've had the worst of times. We've had a lot of things, just like a lot of people have. So I understand completely. And I'm not saying that it feels good while we're going through it. I am saying that God will turn even evil things around for your good and his glory somehow. So let's really quickly talk about why God allows bad things or us to go through trials. There in your notes, the Lord allows trials in our life to mature us spiritually. Catch this. You can know all the scripture in all 66 books of the Bible, you can know every promise that God has made. But until you go through a trial and you have to press in and believe that promise, it means nothing. Knowing it without having to live it means nothing. OK, trials cause us to rely more on him. Next one. The Lord allows trials in our life to strengthen us. You know, when I took church history in Bible college, I was amazed. I knew a little bit about it. But once I really studied, I come to find out that the church, every time that it went through easy times, it got weak and lethargic and did nothing. Every time the church went through a trial, suffering, persecution, the church rose up, grew up and went on as Christian soldiers. Human nature is to revert back to reliance on self when things are going good. Your worship time is probably the best when you're going through a trial. I almost guarantee it. When something happens in our life that we can't handle, we go to the person who can handle it. All right, next. The Lord allows trials in our life to prove himself faithful. Uh, again, if you never went through a trial, how would you know his promises are true? You go through one of these moments, whether it's a loss of a parent or a sibling or a child or, or whatever it is. And during it, 
It's human nature to think God has forgotten me. It's human nature to think, where are you, God, when it hurts? It's human nature, but it's not right. You get down the road a little bit from that trial, and then all of a sudden you start believing what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 8. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is in control. There are no accidents. And he loves you and he's faithful. And then the next one, the Lord's purpose for us during trials is to conform us into the image of Christ. How do I know that? Because the very next verse after Paul says all things work together for good, he says this, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined for what? To be conformed into the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, here's our biggest problem. We look at the here and now like this is the real world. You are currently living in the matrix. I got bad news for you. This is not the real world. Okay, this is a dress rehearsal for the real world. And so we don't see the big picture. We see what's right in front of us. And God sees the whole thing. And though this doesn't feel good for a time, I'm going to work it out. You know, trials and suffering could also be used to prepare us for something great. And this is the hard one, right? God, why? Would you take my dad from me? Why would you do this? Why? I want you to think about Joseph in the Old Testament. Remember poor Joseph, coat of many colors. You probably learned that in Sunday school. This poor guy, he goes out and his brothers sell him into slavery. And then he, he's helping, you know, this guy out. And the guy's wife accuses him falsely of rape. And then... The king has a problem and, and he foretells his dream and they forget all about him. Remember that story? Okay, well, fast forward all the way to the end. Dad is dead. Genesis is about to close out. And the brothers think, now that dad's dead, old Joey, he's going to kill us. And I mean, maybe in the flesh, you'd want to do that too. But this is what it says in Genesis 50, 19. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant it evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as this day to save many people alive. Here's a guy who's got an eternal perspective. I was sold into slavery. I was accused of rape. I was forgotten in prison. And he says, you meant it for evil, but God worked it all out for good. That's hard. Here's where I have to land is that the Lord knows every tear I cry. God knows every broken heart I've ever had. He doesn't forget it. And not one part of my suffering is wasted in vain. Part of trusting God, I would say the hardest part of being a Christian and trusting in God is trusting him during the trials. You know, because sometimes God removes those trials. And those are the times I'm like, oh, thank you, Lord. But sometimes God leaves those trials in my life to teach me something. You know what something else it does? Trials make me more like Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not claiming I'm a deity or anything. But it, it conforms me a little. And you would say, how? Prove that to me. Okay, great. Hebrews 5.8. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Imagine being this church that Paul planted. And again, Paul wrote, you know, over half the New Testament and Paul planted all these churches. And now you're getting this letter and you're thinking, what did Paul do wrong? Did God remove his favor from him? Why would God allow Paul to be sitting in prison? Why? But Paul was not out of the will of God at all. Paul was dead smack in the middle of the will of God. There in your notes, when Paul was in Philippi back in Acts 16, the Holy Spirit broke him out of prison. So God is able. God's able to deliver him. But the second part, but here, while in jail in Philippians 1, the Lord had Paul write Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Now, again, think about this. Those are known as the prison epistles because Paul was under arrest when he wrote them. 
Okay? Imagine this for just a minute. Would you be willing to go through what Paul went through if you knew without a shadow of a doubt that God was going to use you to pen those three letters that have saved so many people's souls? I don't think Paul would have changed a thing. And that leads us to Roman numeral four, the jailhouse gospel. Look at verse 13. And I love this so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So really quickly, I don't want to drag this out, but to understand what was going on, I kind of need to give you a story of how Paul ended up arrested. If you remember this story, the church in Jerusalem was going through a lot of persecution. So Paul asked a lot of the other churches to take up offerings to help them. Once the money was there, Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem himself and deliver this gift. OK, once he's in Jerusalem, Paul, like he was accustomed to, goes into the temple and he starts preaching the gospel in a Jewish temple. The Jewish leaders weren't so happy. Some folks from Asia Minor were there and recognized him. And they started this big upheaval. And this is what they accused Paul of doing. Opposing Judaism, causing a division and breaking the Jewish law. So this riot breaks out and they're beating Paul to a pulp. And the Roman guards rush in and they get Paul out of there before they killed him. And they want to talk to him. Why did you cause this riot? So they take him to the Antonio Fortress and they interrogate him. And he preaches the gospel to them. Then they take him back to the Sanhedrin. And in, before the Sanhedrin, he starts preaching. And the Sanhedrin is split on the words that Paul is saying. And so they don't know what to do. So eventually they send him to Governor Felix. In front of Governor Felix, Paul preaches the gospel again. And Felix doesn't know what to do with him. And so Paul's saying, look, it's my right as a Roman citizen. Send me to Caesar. Before they send him to Caesar, they send him to King Agrippa. And before King Agrippa, Paul preaches the gospel. You got it again. King Agrippa hears this and says, send him to Caesar for crying out loud. I don't know what to do with him. And so here in Philippians chapter one, Paul is under arrest for preaching the gospel. There in your notes, Paul's chains enabled him to reach people he could have never reached if he were not under house arrest. I want you to think about this. And to me, it's hilarious. Again, I wasn't the guy in jail, so or being beaten. But Paul was chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day, six hour shifts, four different guards a day. Think about this. This captive audience, <laughs> these pagan non-believers, and they get to hear Paul pray. Paul preach the gospel and Paul read the Bible. Can you imagine? And they're like, hey, let me clean the stalls. Don't make me do another six hour shift with this guy, please. Paul says it became evident to the whole palace guard. How big is the whole palace guard? 600, a cohort? I, I mean, I don't know. There in your notes, these guards were a captive audience and Paul would have never had this opportunity if he wasn't under house arrest again. Next there in your notes. But there's another group of people Paul was able to reach because of his arrest. The Roman officials in Caesar's court. Think about this. The Romans hear about this Paul guy and hear this new sect of religion that he's he's preaching and they want to know. So, Paul, come before the Roman officials and tell me. And Paul's like, I get to preach the gospel again. <laughs> Imagine. The Roman officials, after the whole palace guard knows, now the Roman officials, and they're all hearing the gospel. He was able to put his personal needs and desires aside because he had an eternal perspective. And notice again, verse 14. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains and much more bold to speak the word without fear. There in your notes. Paul's boldness to preach the gospel while under arrest gave the other Christians around him confidence and boldness 
to speak about Jesus as well. Make this personal this morning. I don't know about you, but when there's a newer Christian who's just starting to have the light bulb go off, you know, you see it right above their head and they're like, whoa, you mean, you mean. And then all of a sudden, not only are they learning, but they have this zeal. It's contagious. You know, new Christians are too dumb to know that you're not supposed to share your faith. That was sarcasm, okay? (laughs) But these new Christians are bold to share their faith. And what does that do to me? That gives me more boldness to share as well. You see, the Christians around Paul witnessed a joy in Paul that shouldn't have been there. He's in jail. He's been beaten. He's being tried. He shouldn't have joy. The Christians around Paul saw God taking care of Paul's needs even while under arrest. And the Christians saw God using Paul as a tool even while under arrest. So seeing these believers be more bold in their faith because they were spurred on to good works. Hebrews 10, 23 says this, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So let's get practical this morning. Paul's prayer here was telling these Christians that spreading the gospel was so much more important than the temporary trials they were going through, no matter what they were. Jay Adams in his book, How to Handle Trouble, said this, So throughout these verses, we encounter not a Paul who is passively languishing in prison, but an active, alert, working missionary who has carved out a new and exciting ministry in the midst of this great trial. Here is not a person who's given up, but one who's hard at the Lord's work and eagerly laying plans for a new ongoing ministry in the future. Paul was on top of of his trouble. If you've been here more than twice, you've probably heard me say the sentence, all means all, and that's all all means. And so to prove it to you, I thought I'd go to the Greek lexicon and look up the word all. So let me tell you what the Greek lexicon says about the word all. It means all. (laughs) Each, every, any, the whole, everybody, all things, everything. That's pretty inclusive, right? So when I say all means all, and that's all, all means, that's all, all means. So with that in mind, the meaning of the word all, let's again read Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, God can manage every part of my life. And even those sinful moments, even those moments of a loved one dying or whatever, God will turn it around for good somehow. Again, when my dad committed suicide when I was 17 and a half, I went wild for five and a half years. I I rebelled against the Lord and everything the Lord had. I was so angry. I was so disappointed. And I didn't know. And then when God called me home, he grabbed me by the suspenders, took me off the cliff and put my feet on the rock. When he did that, I still didn't understand this verse. And I still said, God, I love you. I'll serve you, but I'm never going to get that verse. How can all things, how can this work out together for good? Well, you know, several years later, I got into the ministry. And after 20 some years of the ministry, I'm here to tell you there's never been a week, not one week in 20 whatever years it's been that I haven't had someone in my office talk to me about suicide, whether it was them or a family member or someone they knew or. And, you know, it took me a long time because I'm pretty slow to learn. But I thought, you know, that's how God turns this around and works it out for good in his glory. But I know that I know that I know that I know that God has used that in my life and will continue to use it in my life because he is good. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalms 56, 8. You number my wanderings. You put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? 
When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know. Why? Because God is for me. He knows every tear we cry. He puts them in a bottle and they're written in his book because he's for you. God can even take our sufferings and work them out for good because he manages the affairs of our life. And I know it's tough. And I do understand. Here's the biggest part of our problem. Here's your aha moment. Our problem with believing that God works all things together for good is because we're short-sighted. We think that we're supposed to be comfortable in this life. And we think that trials are not good, but God has a different opinion of good than we do. Because if God can use this somehow to save someone else, even though it hurts. So here's some questions as we end. What would you be willing to give up for the furtherance of the gospel this morning? What would you be willing to endure if it resulted in somebody accepting the good news of Jesus Christ this morning? And how important is spreading the gospel to you? How important is it? Is spreading the gospel more important than you being comfortable? Ephesians 2.10, Paul said, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that's before the beginning of the world, that we should walk in them. God, before the world was created, had good works in mind for us and our part. He created the good works. He created the world. He created us. Our part, walk in them. Walk in them. Our part is to walk in them. Discover what God has created you to do. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, because you can't do it without him, walk in them. You see, here's the deal. If you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, not only do you have natural talents, but you have spiritual gifts that God has given. And he very clearly said, I created you as my Mona Lisa. I created you as my masterpiece. I created you as my poem to walk in these good works that I determined well before you were even an apple in your daddy's eye that you should walk in them. If you're a true believer here this morning, you have a ministry. And here it is. Further the gospel. Whatever God's called you to do, do it. You're his masterpiece. You're his workmanship, his poema in the Greek, which is where we get the word poem. You're God's poem created for good works. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. We'll be in the back. We'd love to pray for you. And you know, God's so, so, so good to us. Paul had an eternal perspective. You know, later we're going to hear how he said, for me to live is Christ. But to die is gain, and I don't know which one's better. What do you do to that guy? What do you do to a guy with an attitude like that? May that be our heart. Lord, I want to serve you, whatever that looks like. And I'm going to count these momentary trials here on earth, since it's just a dress rehearsal, in a thousand years they won't mean much. It hurts, but I'm going to trust you in the pain. I'm going to let you grow me in the pain, and I'm going to serve you. Thank you for listening to Pastor Rich's message, The Furtherance of the Gospel, from Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. Next week, we will continue in the book of Philippians. Join us every Sunday morning in person at 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. or online at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Watch our live stream on our website, YouTube, or Facebook. Our website is livingfaithklamath.com. Find our social media by searching for Living Faith Fellowship Klamath. You can also find all of our links in the description of this week's episode. All sermons are available on our website. Find resources at the top and then click on sermons. If you want to show your appreciation, you can tell others about us, subscribe to our podcast, and you can also leave a review so more people can hear the word of God. Thank you again and God bless you.